Despite the dirty tricks, despite the vaunted Nassau County Republican machine, we won. Democrats flip George Santos's seat. Democrat Tom Suozzi is heading to Washington after New York's third congressional voters chose him over Mozzie Phillip in the special election. That means Republican House Speaker Mike Johnson's majority is now even slimmer, with Republicans having 219 seats and Democrats now plus one with 213. Joining me now with fresh reaction is my friend and colleague, Julia Manchester. Hey, Jules, so what is this going to mean for the balance of power as it relates to policy in the House of Representatives? Well, Kevin, it means that Johnson have, has a bit of a narrower majority than he did before. You know, last night the House voted to impeach Mayorkas for the second time, or it was their second attempt. They were successful, and there, I think, was a reason why they were trying to get this over with, because they knew they had this special election, and the special election could really go either way. So they wanted to get this uh, through as quickly as possible. But going forward, it's certainly going to be tougher for Republicans in that house and then going forward to you know what this means in 2024 and the general election look i mean this could be a warning sign to some republicans um in terms of how democrats running in swing districts are running when republicans are trying to tie these democrats to president biden swazi was very careful um you know to be a moderate to distance himself from the president and he was successful well, you know, I think it is a win for moderates, number one, uh, to, to your point. But secondly, we always talk about how partisan and polarized our country is. We are a, 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 a sharply divided nation, but we're also a closely divided nation, and, and as evidenced by the balance of power in the House of Representatives. And so for all of the pressure that the far right flank of the Republican Party has placed on Speaker Johnson, Julia, he, at some point, is going to have to grapple with this idea of the state and local tax deduction for moderate Republicans, as well as more than a dozen seats in the upcoming election, as you've just alluded to on these down-ballot races, that Biden won that Republicans occupy. So specifically, if you're in one of those swing districts, as you mentioned, how is this going to change the way that you're campaigning uh, heading into November? Well, for someone like Mike Lawler, I mean, you don't have to look any farther than New York State and the down uh, state part of New York. Mike Lawler, Anthony D. Esposito, um, you know, Mark Molinaro, you have these Republicans who are up for reelection who are, you know, maybe lean more towards that moderate end of the spectrum. They're, you know, going, th this is a big warning sign for them. Now, I think, I think Mozzie Phillip was definitely maybe a bit more, was running a little bit more conservative than them, but I think these Republicans running down ballot who are moderate are going to take a hard look at their races because if you have their Democratic opponents taking a page out of Tom Suozzi's playbook, that's going to make uh, their lives, the Republicans' lives, a lot harder in their reelection bids. Now, this is a special election. You can't take you know too, too much from special elections. Turnout is obviously different. Tom Suozzi himself, a fixture in Long Island politics, uh, but certainly a warning sign for some of these Republicans defending their seats and also also a warning sign for Speaker Johnson. I think you alluded to this earlier, Kevin. You know, Speaker Johnson is under pressure from the right flank of his party, but at the same time, he has to work to support those moderates, and many of those moderates are the reason why Republicans have a majority. You know, Long Island in many ways is a lot like Delco, where I grew up. What does this say about the far left flank, that the, that the Democrats in Long Island put up a moderate Democrat and he won? as opposed to some of these left flank folks who have, who have divided Biden's base, who have uh, hurt him in states like Michigan. What does it say, say about those folks and the path forward and the playbook that Democrats should be following uh, in the midterm elections? So you're absolutely right. There are two sides to this coin. And, you know, I mentioned uh, Mike Lawler's district and you have Mike Lawler likely going again up against former Congressman Mondaire Jones, who is a progressive. So yep. I'm curious to see 
how he tackles this issue because he is from the left-leaning flank of the party. Does he try to make his uh, position more centrist in that uh, district? Because if he runs as a progressive against Lawler, you know, that could be a very risky strategy as well. You know, I just said that moderate Republicans are the reason for that party's majority or a big reason for that party's majority. The same thing goes for Democrats. So I think you're going to have both of these parties really grappling with how the moderates and or the, how the, the far right and progressives yeah are impacting those vulnerable moderates. Yeah, we, we've moved on, folks, past the phase, uh, past the, the era, rather, of being a moderate means that you're in the tank for corporate America and big business. We've moved on from that in this uh, hyper-partisan, hyper-polarized time uh, when you've got someone like a, a Democrat like Swazi winning up there in Long Island. Meanwhile, for the first time in almost 150 years, a cabinet secretary has been impeached. Republicans impeached Defense Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. Last night, the House voted to approve articles of impeachment against Secretary Mayorkas. Desperate times call for desperate measures. We had to do that. He has abdicated his responsibility, he's breached the public trust, and he's disregarded the laws Congress has passed. They engage in a sham exercise that not only degrades the value, the importance of this important democratic institution, Julia, so he's not likely going to be convicted in the Senate, but do you think that this is going to change anything in terms of significant policy getting accomplished across the border? I don't think it's going to you know, lead to any major changes. I think this is something Republicans can point to and say, look, we took action on the border and, you know, tr you know, impeached Mayorkas. We did our part. Now it's up to, you know, Republicans and Democrats in the Senate. Like you said, that's obvious. That's likely not going to happen there. But, you know, I think this is, you know, yet again, another partisan move. I mean, I think there's been opportunity for Republicans and Democrats to tackle this issue of immigration reform. But we've seen, um, you know, a number of hurdles get in the way of both parties, mainly partisanship, um, you know, on both sides. So, I mean, I think this is just another political tactic, something that, you know, Johnson can, you know, when talking to the right flank of the base, can talk about, bring up. But ultimately, I don't think it's going to lead to any major policy changes, at least, uh, you know, for this election cycle. The Democratic Senatorial Campaign Committee is out with an ad saying that Republicans are blocking meaningful legislation for the border. Take a look. Look at their new ad. This is the toughest border bill in a generation. This is what Republicans were demanding. We all were saying a this week ago before we Donald get. Trump stepped in. He said the best border security bill ever. Now they're saying we're going to kill it. We had a lot of crazy in the last uh, seven or eight years. Uh, the Border Patrol Union came out and the acting CBP chief both came out and said they're not. It's not perfect, but this is the best thing we've seen in decades. Is this going to backfire on Republicans? You know, it could, and this is what we're going to see Democrats, this is how they're going to fight back about against this issue of the border. We know that the border has been a weak spot for Democrats, particularly under the Biden administration and the flow of, um, you know, migrants we've seen over the border and sort of the lack of control um, Republicans say Democrats have over the situation. But look, it's that border bill. It's the first failure to impeach Mayorkas. I mean, I think you're going to see Democrats really point to that as a means of Painting Republicans as incompetent. Now, what's interesting, and I have a piece coming out about this later this week, is, you know, Greg Abbott, the governor of Texas at the southern border, he is one Republican who, while he's very much on the same page as Washington Republicans and vice versa, he is one Republican who has like him or hate him, uh, take take an action on the southern border with the razor, installing the razor wire, going up against the Biden administration. So, you know, I think that's certainly applicable to Washington Republicans, but I think a lot of Republicans are pointing to Abbott and other state level Republicans, the Republican governors, et cetera, as a strength spot for them. Heading now overseas at the United Nations, they are warning of a slaughter in Rafa the southernmost city in Gaza. UN officials say they will not help with the evacuation of the city where 1.4 million people are located. Many of them have fled there since the start of the Israel-Hamas war. Israeli defense forces are considering an attack on Rafah. What's the Biden administration saying, Julia? 
Well, look, I think the Biden administration is trying to walk a very, very fine line. They understand that Israel has this goal of eliminating Hamas and this goal of eliminating Hamas means going into areas like Rafa and, um, you know, targeting them. However, there's this humanitarian component. And quite frankly, this humanitarian component has turned into a bit of a public relations battle for Israel, because you see th these images coming out of Rafa that are absolutely, I think, heartbreaking for a lot of people to watch, as are other images from this entire conflict from both sides. But it's, di I think it's starting to become difficult for Israel and the Biden administration to really try to explain this rationale. So I think it's going to be a long road ahead. I thought it was interesting yesterday how Israel released um, footage of a Hamas leader in a tunnel, I think, in the days since October, in the day, immediate days after October 7th, sort of in a way to, um, I think, illustrate what they're up against, how heavily nuanced and complicated this is. Is, but I think it's a public relations battle on both sides, as it is, you know, a physical battle. It's a horrible situation since that yeah. terrorist attack in Israel on October 7th. Um, switching gears completely, it is Valentine's Day, Julia. Did you hear about this? Chocolate prices are actually the highest that they've been in years because there's a cocoa shortage. Retailers are actually forecasting that consumers will spend more on Valentine's Day than in the past five years. How much money do you think is going to be spent this year alone, Julia Manchester, on Valentine's Day? Okay, so I think you can look at this two ways. You can well, look tell at me the both ways, money Jules. On, on Valentine's Day, the days before, you know, leading up to it, but also the day after Valentine's Day, when all that chocolate is 50%. <laughs> So I don't know. I think it's still going to be. I think people like their chocolate. They're gonna. They're gonna spend as much as they want. But Give me a number. I just Give me a number. A number. I, I don't know. Millions. I, I. I think it's in the millions. I don't think it's much lower than past years. Jules, it's billions, billions of Billion. dollars. I'm gonna give you. I'm gonna give you another uh, another chance to to give me an estimate. But I also okay. want to know your favorite Valentine's Day candy or food. Okay. It doesn't have to be a candy. It doesn't have to be a candy. Oh my gosh, I love um, malted milk eggs, ma Same. malted milk balls. Yeah, it's and I, they're always associated with Easter. But I was actually yeah. in the drugstore yesterday. They had Valentine's versions, so I could eat a whole bag of those. Same Easy. and peanut M and M's. I love my Butterfingers. I love my Twixes. Oh, yes, yes. I love my heart shaped donuts. Um, but fourteen point two billion dollars is how much will be spent on valentine's day alone 14.2 billion dollars that's wild i was lowballing that <laughs> yeah you know hey hey happy yeah. valentine's day julia great reporting as always thanks for coming on the daily debrief thanks you too kevin that's it for today's daily debrief my name is kevin so really be sure to like share and subscribe to the hills youtube channel happy valentine's day everybody and come back here soon for the intersection between politics and policy